Our Lord is indeed great, and it is my intention today to show you how great the Lord is from Psalm 132. And we are also going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 7. So turn with me to, to those two passages, Psalm 132 and then 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 7. And if you have a paper Bible, mark somewhere or mark with something, each of those passages, so that we'll have both of them, because we're going to be going back and forth. Uh, Psalm 132 is kind of, a, kind of broken down into two parts, or kind of two primary movements, if you will. The first 10 verses of Psalm 132 are David's intention to build a house for God. David's intention to build a house for God. Verses 11 through 18 are God's response about building a house for David. So David wants to build God a house, but that was not God's plan. And so we're going to see God's plan is to build a house for David. And Psalm 132 is essentially a a story of God's plans being greater than David's plans. So Psalm 132 and 2 Samuel chapters 6 and 7. Let me pray. Lord, we are thankful for your word. We are thankful for the good news that it teaches us. Lord, that we have a problem with sin and you have a solution in salvation. Lord, I pray that as we look at David in this psalm, that we would see clearly your connection throughout all of history, throughout all the scripture, to Jesus the Messiah, the one who was sent to save and redeem a people for you. Lord, I pray that our words today uh, that we look at, the words that you've given us, would encourage us, that they would equip us, that they would be a a standard that we can hold up, that we can bear to the world, that we follow you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, so before we we get into Psalm 132, it's, it's almost necessary that we have an understanding of David as he relates to the Ark of the Covenant and what the Ark of the Covenant was. So a long time ago, God had given his people this ark, which was a kind of a a large size box, like the size of a coffee table or a large suitcase. They built this ark, and then they overlaid it with gold. So it was a large gold-covered box. Inside the box were three things that told them about God. The first was the stone tablets that God had given Moses on the mountain, the Ten Commandments. They put those Ten Commandments, the stone tablets, into the ark. It was a picture of God's covenant with them, that this is what I will do and I expect of you, and it's a covenant, a picture of the covenant. Then they also put in a jar of manna, which manna was what God had given them from heaven that was a flaky substance that they could eat in the wilderness. So for 40 years, they walked the wilderness and God provided this manna. They put manna into a jar and put it into the Ark of the Covenant, the big box to remind them that God was the one who had provided for them. The third thing that they put in was Aaron's staff. Aaron was a priest and the staff had started to bud like we'll see in a few months on all the trees. They put that in as a reminder of God's atonement, God's covering of their sin, because Aaron was the priest, and the priest was the way that God chose to atone for their sin. All in all, the Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of God's presence for them. Even greater than a symbol, it was often God's presence. It was where God would choose to be when he chose to be in one specific place. On top of the Ark of the Covenant was a seat, and so it was probably fashioned out of gold, and across the, across the sides were two cherubim, like angels with their wings kind of covering this seat. They called it the mercy seat. They would come to God, the priest would come once a year, and he would sprinkle blood onto this mercy seat, asking God for mercy, and God would atone for their sins, or he would cover their sins at this place. So this Ark of the Covenant, the Ark, was really important to the Jewish people and the Israelites because it was God's presence. This was where they would meet God. So 
as we're looking at Psalm 132, and we're looking at 2 Samuel 6 and 7, 2 Samuel 6 and 7 is the history of what actually happened. And Psalm 132 is the psalmist looking back at all of those events. So we have what actually happens. And then in Psalm 132, the writer is saying, this is what we saw. This is what happened. So we're going to kind of read these two passages in conjunction. So we see what was happening and then what the psalmist is seeing as well. So where we're going to pick up the story is in 2 Samuel chapter 6. The Ark of the Covenant should be with God's people. It should be where they are worshiping, which is in Jerusalem. But the Ark of the Covenant is not in Jerusalem. In fact, it's been forgotten about for almost 20 years and in storage of sorts. So let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 6. It says, David again assembled all the young fit men in Israel, 30,000. He and all his troops set out to bring the ark of God from Baal Judah. The ark bears the name, the name of the Lord of armies who is enthroned between the cherubim. They set the ark of God on a new cart and transported it from Abinadab's house, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the cart and brought it with the ark of God from Abinadab's house on the hill. Ahio walked in front of the ark. David and the whole house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all kinds of fir wood instruments, lyres, harps, tambourines, sistrums, and cymbals. So they're bringing this cart. They're on the ark is now sitting on a cart. It was probably a two-wheeled cart that the ox in the front would pull. And there were a couple guys in the front and in the back making sure it didn't tip over and making sure it stayed on the cart. We have Uzzah, who is the primary guy. And then it also says Ahio, which in Hebrew means brothers, so we don't know if that's actually his name or his parents were just like, hey, it's Uzzah and his brother. So we don't know if there were more brothers or if they actually called him brother or what, but at least two or more of Abinadab's sons, which is where the ark had been stored for years, Abinadab's sons were now helping to guide the ark. 2 Samuel 6.6. 6. When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah reached out to the ark and took hold of it because the oxen had stumbled. Then the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah, and God struck him dead on the spot for his irreverence. And he died there next to the ark of God. David was angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, so he named that place Outburst Against Uzzah, as it is today. David feared the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? So he was not willing to bring the ark of the Lord to the city of David. Instead, he diverted it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. The ark of the Lord remained in his house three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his whole family. So for David, he desires to go and get the ark and bring the ark back to Jerusalem. That's a good thing. That's what David wants to do, and it's a good thing. But immediately, things start going wrong. Uzzah, who is the one in the back who's guiding the cart, notices that the ox in the front starts to stumble, and the ark starts to tip over, so he reaches out to grab it to make sure the ark doesn't fall and break or dump its contents out, which we would look at and say, that's a good thing, God shouldn't have killed him for that. But what we're not understanding when we just read it as that is that there's so much history that has gone into this leading up to this moment that the Israelites don't see it the way that we see it. God had been very, very clear with them about what they should do and how they should do it. You'll notice the text says he was killed because of his irreverence. He had no fear of God or reverence or respect of God. Uzzah, who was living in this house for 20 plus years with the Ark of the Covenant, had a casual familiarity with the Ark. He saw the Ark all the time. It was there. They knew it was at their house. And so they were going to bring it. God had told them that nobody is to touch the Ark, that it is a holy thing that nobody should touch. 
So what we see is this picture of God's justice on Uzzah for not obeying what God had said to do. But that's not the only thing. As we read it, we don't really think about that the ark is on a cart, a new cart, it says, a wooden cart. The old one, 20 years old, was probably falling apart, so they built a new cart. But God had told them that in the priestly lineage, there is a family that is supposed to carry the ark. They are to take poles, and they are to run them through the rings that were already built onto the ark, and these men were to probably pick it up and put it on their shoulders and walk with the ark. That was the direction that God had given them. So they touched the ark when they were told not to touch the ark. They put it on a cart when they were told not to put it on a cart. And even further than just putting it on a cart, they learned this from the Philistines, who were their enemies. The Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 6 took the ark after winning a battle and put it on an ark or put it on a cart and took it back to their cities. When they started to have trouble because God was not about that, they sent it out on a cart and they gave it back to the Israelites. They, it caused them so much trouble, they sent gold and they didn't want the ark. So the Philistines put it on a cart and sent it back to Israel. And now we have the Israelites, David, doing exactly what God had told them not to do and how not to treat the ark. So now let's go back to Psalm 132 and we'll kind of pick up in the story where David desires to go get the ark. Psalm 132 says, Lord, remember David and all the hardships he endured. Probably speaking about this first trip and seeing Uzzah die. And how he swore an oath to the Lord, making a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. Here's David's vow. I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not allow my eyes to sleep or my eyelids to slumber until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. So David knows that they've done wrong by God. They can see Uzzah dead on the ground. It probably occurs to them that this all occurred at a threshing floor, which is a, either a flattened rock or a, a packed hard ground area that they could bring their wheat and they would beat their wheat on the ground to separate out the kernels. And then they would separate out the chaff, which was like the, the husk of the kernel. And so they would have the wheat and the chaff, and they would take them in these big kind of wicker baskets, and they would throw it up in the air. So the chaff would blow away, and the wheat would fall back down. They would separate out what was good from what was bad. I don't think the coincidence was lost on David that Uzzah was bad. And God separated the bad from the good at the threshing floor. So now they look back and they say, look at all the hardships, the psalmist is saying, that David has endured. See, when David went to get the ark, it was a casual desire to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. He didn't do what God said. They didn't do it in the way that God said it. And David had already been living in Jerusalem without the presence of God. But now what the psalmist is telling us is when David goes back to get it, it's no longer simply a casual desire. It's not about the parade. It's not about the people. But we see David's heart behind his vow. We see the promise that he makes, the vow. It says that he swore and made a vow. In Psalm 132, the first two verses have a lot of covenant language. A covenant is a contract or a promise made between people. When the Bible speaks about it, it's between people and God. David was making a vow or a covenant between God. And the psalmist is reminding God that God had also made a vow. He says, Lord, remember David. Remember the covenant that you made with David. And also remember the, the vow, how David swore an oath to the Lord. So the psalmist is reminding us that this is more than just a promise. This isn't something that is just to be taken lightly. It's not them asking God to remember to get milk on the way home. 
They're saying, Lord, remember you promised. You made a covenant with us. And also, God, David has made a covenant with you. He has sworn a vow to you. David's vow is verses 3, 4, and 5. It's very extreme when you think about it. This is the vow David makes. I will not enter my house. I will not get into my bed. I will not allow my eyes to sleep. I will not allow my eyelids to slumber until, until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. See, David's promise to God is that your presence is important. I want to bring the ark and give you a house to live in, a proper place that the Lord can dwell. David had the right heart. He wanted to do the right thing, but he was doing it all the wrong ways. David's focus was right. His desire to see God have a permanent house was a good thing. See, when we look at things like this, we, I mean, we kind of flippantly will swear and promise and make vows and oaths. We'll sign things and go back on them. For us, swearing, vows, oaths are not very important. When it comes to God, God had been very specific with them that when they make a vow or when they swear, when they make a covenant, that it was not to be broken. David knew that these words were more than just words. They were a vow, a contract, a covenant, a promise that was not to be broken. And when David spoke these words, he also knew that there would be a cost, right? that he's willing to do what he knows he should do to build this house. But in so doing, he's going to have to sacrifice. I'm not going to go into my house. I'm not going to enjoy my house. I'm not going to sleep. I'm not going to rest. I'm going to be single focused on doing this thing for God. David's promise to God came with a cost. When was the last time that you committed something to God that cost you something? When was the last time that you did something for the Lord that had a cost? Maybe it was financial, maybe it was time, maybe it was energy, maybe it was sacrificing something in some way, but something for God that cost you something. See, a heart that wants to sacrifice, as David did, knows that it's going to pay a price. It's going to cost sleep. It's going to cost time. It's going to mean plans change and priorities change and you lose out on comforts. I will not sleep until, is what David's saying. I'm going to forsake everything else and let this be the one thing that is important to me. We are very, very casual and comfortable in our worship, in our service, in our prayer. We're casual and we're comfortable with knowing God and making him known. See, when a heart desires to do something for the Lord, it always comes with a cost. But for many Christians, Christianity is an ark that has been stuck in the back of the garage and forgotten about for 20 years. I come to church... Isn't that what God wants? I have four Bibles and I could find them if I needed one. We've taken and adopted the same casual attitude that David had about the ark. David's heart was right. But David did not do what God wanted him to do. God had already given instructions and David did not do them. Look at verse 6 in Psalm 132. 
So David had left the ark at Obed-Edom's house. God had blessed Obed-Edom and his family. And now David, three months later, is going back to get the ark. It says, We have heard of the ark in Ephrathath. We found it in the fields of Jar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Rise up, Lord. Come to your resting place, you and your powerful ark. May your priests be clothed with righteousness. And may your powerful people shout for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not reject your anointed one. See, David is ready to go back, and he again uses language that is explicitly instructing the Israelites. You know, things that we don't readily look at and understand. But when David says in verse 8, rise up, Lord, the Israelites all would have been like, oh, he said it. Throughout the wilderness journey that the Israelites went on, throughout those 40 years of wandering in the desert, every time they were to move somewhere, Moses would go to the ark, and do you know what he would say? He would say, rise up, Lord. Exodus 33 lists 41 different times that they moved somewhere. And every time, Numbers 23 says, Moses would go and say, Arise, Lord. Or, Rise, Lord. Because wherever the ark was going, God's people were following. 41 times at least, they moved somewhere because Moses said, Rise up, Lord. Take us where you want us to go. And 41 times, they also rose up and they followed the Lord. See, David is saying, rise up, Lord, that we might follow you. Rise up, Lord, and come to your resting place, you and your powerful ark. Like you taught us for 40 years in the desert, where you go, we go. Where you rise and walk, we rise and walk. So David's ready to get the ark because he's ready for the Lord to rise up that they can follow the ark back to Jerusalem back to the dwelling place that David is ready to build for God. Okay, let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 6. We'll pick it up in verse 12. It was reported to King David that the Lord had blessed Obed-Edom's family and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and had the ark of God brought up from Obed-Edom's house to the city of David with rejoicing. When those carrying the ark of the Lord... Pause, we're going to pause. When those carrying the ark of the Lord. Notice the difference that previously they got the ark and they put it on a cart. And the cart was dragged by ox and watched by Uzzah and his brothers. But now, when those carrying the ark. You see, David went and he looked in the law and he said, what exactly did God say? Uzzah's dead. We clearly have messed things up. So what exactly did God tell us to do? He says, go and get this family, get the long poles, put them through the rings, and have the men carry it. They said, okay, go get the poles, go get the men. We're going to carry it. So when those carrying the ark of the Lord advanced six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened calf. Now, can you imagine making that journey that every six steps, two, three, four, five, six, every six steps, they would stop and they would sacrifice. They would slit the throat and slit the throat and they would sacrifice these animals to God. And they would take literally six more steps and do it again. You see, David was religious in the beginning. David wanted to have a parade. He wanted people to follow, to be excited. But David was not devoted to God. David simply wanted to do something that he thought would be good, but it was religious in its nature. David went back to God's word and said, what exactly did God tell us to do? See, David left the religiousness and went to a radical devotion for what God had called them to do. David wanted to know to the letter, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to obey God? So let's look at David's 
devotion here in the next couple of verses. 2 Samuel 6, 14. David was dancing with all his might before the Lord, wearing a linen ephod. He and the whole house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and with the sound of the ram's horn, like a trumpet. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Saul's daughter, Michael, who is also David's wife, looked down from the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. and She despised him in her heart. So here we have the king of Israel who is supposed to be kingly. He is supposed to be wearing his royal robes, wearing a crown, having servants follow him. He's supposed to be acting like a king. But here's David, he's stripped down and he's dancing in the streets. The word that says dancing, is, it literally means he's spinning and twirling around. The picture here is David just doesn't care. He doesn't care who sees him. You know, my younger girls, they love to put on dresses and just spin around. They want to see the dress fly out. They want other people to see them with their dress flying out. And they're just living. They're just enjoying. They don't have embarrassment. David should have embarrassment. His wife is looking at him, and she has secondhand embarrassment. She's up in her palace, literally looking down her nose at him and saying, Dave, bro, you are embarrassing me. Stop acting like this. For our family, please. But David is, David's given up the religious. David's given up caring what she thinks. David doesn't care who sees him dancing without dignity. He's worshiping without worry. He's devoted to God. See, David doesn't have to have the approval of other people anymore. David knows what God has called him to do, and he is going to do it. He's going to be reverent and not care about his reputation. David's going to be faithful to God over the formality that the kings would be expected to live like. See, David looks, and his wife is trying to shame him. The people are certainly like, this is different. This is new. We've never seen a king act like this. And David's all in. He's fully given himself to worshiping the Lord in this way. David, more than anything, wanted God's presence to be honored. He wanted to bring God's presence back to Jerusalem that God might be honored. Keep going, verse 17. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent David had pitched for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings in the Lord's presence. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of armies. Then he distributed a loaf of bread, a date cake, and a raisin cake to each one in the entire Israelite community, both men and women, and then all the people went home. So all the people, they come together and they're celebrating that God has his place in this tent. God is back in Jerusalem, God is back in a tent, and they've done what they were supposed to do. So they celebrate. They, I don't know why they give each other date cakes and raisin cakes. I think it was a, meant to be a good thing. It feels like a fruit cake to me, like... Here's your fruitcake. But this was a way of celebrating. So David celebrates with all the men and the women who are there. And then he goes home to do the same. Verse 20, when David returned home to bless his household, Saul's daughter, Michael, his wife, came out to meet him. Here's what she says. How the king of Israel honored himself today. How he exposed himself in the sight of the slave girls, of his subjects, like a vulgar person would expose himself. David replied to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me over your father and his whole family to appoint me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will dance before the Lord. I will dishonor myself and humble myself even more. However, by the slave girls you spoke about, I will be honored. And Saul's daughter, Michael, had no child to the day of her death. See, David looks at his wife, 
who is trying to shame him for a, a complete and sold out devotion to God and tell him, you need to get it together. Act like you're supposed to act. And he's like, I am just getting started. You've not seen anything yet. You think that was shameful and embarrassing? Man, just wait until I continue to fully devote myself to God. I'm going to keep going. And you know what? Those slave girls that you think are going to be embarrassed and shamed, like our household people, they won't be. But God vindicated David. Michael had no children to the day of her death. There was not a greater punishment for women of this time than to not have sons and not have children. See, she stood opposed to what God was doing and she found out what happens. See, David's vow, David's promise in Psalm 132, his covenant with God, produced in David an action. David's heart wanted to do something for God. The heart's desire produced in David action. David didn't just make a vow and go to bed. He didn't say, I'm not going to sleep, or I'm not going to slumber, I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to rest until you get a house. But David did that. You see, talk is cheap. We wouldn't be telling a story about David if David never did the things he said he was going to do. When we have a heart that desires to do something for God, there should be actions that follow. We should not only desire that, but we should go out and do it. If you want to serve God, then get your hands dirty. If you want to reconcile with your spouse, then start writing a letter of apology. If you want to love your kids, then lose your phone. If you want to know God, open the Bible before you open Instagram. See, if we say, my heart loves and serves God and wants to make promises, wants to commit to God, wants to see the lives of my family better, then it takes an action also. Because you can sit on your phone or sit watching TV for the rest of your life and nothing will happen. David's example to us is knowing what God said, how he ought to do what God said, and then actually doing what God said. A lot of people want to be like Jesus. Nobody wants to love a prostitute. Nobody wants to wash someone's feet. Nobody wants to sacrifice. Nobody wants to forgive before an apology is given. We want the actions without the heart. We want the heart without the actions. When God calls someone to himself, he doesn't call a change of action. He doesn't call a change of heart. God calls a change and he changes the person. See, in Psalm 132, it says later, we're going to read it, I will clothe its priests with salvation, verse 16. God here is giving this picture of these priests that used to bring sacrifice to God, and God would offer salvation. Peter says that we are holy priests, a royal priesthood, that God has, through Christ, offered sacrifice and offered salvation. When God calls someone and God indwells them with his Holy Spirit, they're changed from the inside out. Nobody changes their actions and and gets God's approval. Nobody changes their own heart and gets God's approval. God calls someone, he recreates them, gives them a heart of flesh, and out of that heart of flesh, they desire and do what God calls them to do. David abandoned all of the religious and went straight to the devoted His heart was then followed by his actions. 
So the ark gets back to Jerusalem. And look in, verse, and look in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel. The ark's back in Jerusalem. And when the king had settled into his palace, the Lord had given him rest on every side from his enemies. The king said to the prophet Nathan, who the prophet had like a direct line of communication with God. So David goes to Nathan and says, look, I'm living in a cedar house, which is a good thing. I'm living in a cedar house while the ark of God sits inside tent curtains. So from a similar window that his wife looked on him with scorn, David looks on the ark sitting in a tent and recognizes, why am I in this beautiful palace and God's presence is in a tent? So Nathan told the king, verse 3, go and do all that is on your mind for the Lord is with you. So in David's mind is, I'm going to build a big palace. I'm going to build a big temple. It's going to be beautiful with cedar or imported Italian stone, I think is what we would look for today. It's like, this is going to be a grand, beautiful building for God. But verse four, but that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go to my servant David and say, this is what the Lord says. Are you to build me a house to dwell in? From the time I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until today, I have not dwelt in a house. Instead, I have been moving around with tents as my dwelling. In all my journeys with the Israelites, have I ever spoken a word to one of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, asking them, why haven't you built me a house of cedar? So now this is what you are to say to David. This is what the Lord of armies says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock to be the ruler of my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before you. I will make a great name for you like the greatest name on the earth. I will designate a place for my people, Israel, and plant them, so they will live there and not be disturbed again. Evil doers will not continue to oppress them as they have done ever since the day I ordered the judges to be over my people, Israel." I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you, the Lord himself will make a house for you. When your time comes and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after you its descendant who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will discipline him with the rod of men and blows from mortals. But my faithful love will never leave him as it did when I removed it from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. So David looks and sees this ark in a tent and knows this isn't right. I'm in a beautiful palace. God's presence is in a tent so David says to Nathan, hey, I've got a plan. Nathan says, two thumbs way up, buddy. Go for it. Build this house. Nathan then hears immediately from God that night, and God's like, no, buddy. Nobody's building a house for me. I don't need your house. Thanks, but no thanks. You might remember Stephen in Acts chapter 6, the very end, right before they get so mad and they kill Stephen, Stephen says, God does not dwell in houses built by man. Right here, this temple that I'm standing in, not where God lives. God does not dwell in houses built by man. See, God, David wanted to build God a house, but God did not want simply a house built. God's plan was so much bigger than David's plan because God was building David a house. David was going to have a dynasty, a legacy. His own son Solomon would build a house. But even greater than that, what God is saying is, you will have someone on your throne forever. You're not just going to have a house and a throne and you're going to die and someone's going to capture you. And But forever, I will put someone of your family on the throne. See, David was looking at this little house And God's saying, I have so much more than just a house. In Psalm 132, verses 11 and 12, the Lord swore an oath to David, a promise he will not abandon. 
I will set one of your offspring on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my, dis- my decrees that I teach them, their sons will also sit on your throne. Covenant language. God making a promise, an oath, a covenant with David. That one of your offspring, one of your great, 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 great grandchildren will sit on your throne forever. So when we look back into history and we see David, we see many, many, many faithful people like David. In Hebrews chapter 11, it's what's called the hall of faith. It starts out by saying that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. A definition of faith is not something that you can reach out and touch or just look at and understand. And Hebrews 11 then talks about, I don't know, 30 or 40 people that all had faith. They all were like David who looked forward to a promise. They had not yet been given the promise, but they knew that God had promised. They knew that God was faithful. So they were able to, they were able to look forward to what was going to come. David is mentioned, and it says all of these at the end of chapter 11 were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect without us. Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, the author of Hebrews saying, since there's so many historical witnesses that have testified to this, Let us run the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. You see, David wanted to build God a little house. And God said, man, David, I've got a plan that is like, you're not even going to be able to believe it. If I told you the plan that wasn't just a house and a temple in this time period right now, but I explained to you the whole plan, you wouldn't even get it. So I'm just giving you this glimpse of you will have an offspring on the throne forever. We now have the ability to look back at all of this history that David lived through and the psalmist lived through and all of the people in Hebrews 11, they lived through all of this. And now we're over here and we can look at it and we can say, oh, I know what the psalmist meant in Psalm 132 when he said your offspring will be on your throne forever. That I, I, I'm not going to, be able to build a house for God because God is building a dynasty. We look back, but they were in the middle of it having faith in God that what God was building, God's plan was perfect and it was greater than them. Hebrews says that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. See, when God set out to build, he didn't set out to simply build a house that we could live in. What God set out to build was a bridge for us to cross. See, we live on the sinful humanity side and on the other side of a great canyon that's infinitely deep and infinitely wide. On the other side is where God lives. On this side... We can live in our fancy cedar houses. We can wear the fancy king's clothes. We can live a good and happy life. But at some point, we all end up in the canyon of sin and death and hell. God didn't come to build us houses that we could live in, that we could just enjoy for 80 years and then die and spend eternity in hell. See, God came to build a bridge and that bridge was Jesus. Jesus calls himself the way. God says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. God sent Jesus to be the bridge between us and himself. And just like David, just like the Israelites, God has given us explicit instructions. Now everybody falls onto one of either two camps. I'm going to do it like David did the first time, just whatever I think is best. I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to do good works. I'm going to serve the homeless. I'm going to give money to charities. I'm going to be kind to my grandma and my neighbor. Like, I'm going to do those good things. But like Uzzah, we will all die in our good works. 
they will not save us. Or we act as if David did when he later knew exactly what God said. Because God said, the only way across is through Jesus. Anyone who believes in Jesus will have eternal life. That anyone who is willing to believe and have faith, not knowing what it all means, but looking forward and saying, I know that Jesus came down from heaven to die on the cross, to pay for my sins, because I've done so many things wrong. That's faith. That's believing. The Bible says anyone who believes will be saved. Anyone who trusts that they will end up in hell on their own account and needs to be saved and believes and repents, turns away from their sin and looks forward to the bridge that Christ offers. Looks forward not to all of the great that I have here and all the good that I'm doing here, but looks forward, abandons the religious and lives for the devoted. See, Jesus was the perfect plan. David wanted to build a house, but God was building something so much greater than David could have even imagined. Psalm 132 ends with these statements from God, very absolute statements. For the Lord has chosen Zion, for he has desired it for his home. This is my resting place forever. I will make my home here because I have desired it. I will abundantly bless its food. I will satisfy its needy with bread. I will clothe its priests with salvation, and its faithful people will shout for joy. There I will make a horn grow for David, a symbol of power. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed one, a picture of David's descendancy. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but the crown he wears will be glorious. You see, God has absolute power over all things, and is sovereign over all things, and he makes these statements, I will do these things. The psalmist puts them in contrast with David's statements in the beginning. I will do these things. I will not sleep. I will not rest. I will not eat. I will not. I will focus on you. And David, for all his heart and all his desire, he was still but a man. But then we have God's coming, God coming in and saying, these are the things that I will do. And with God, there is no changing, there is no shifting, there are no differences. God is the same as he always has been. David was a man, and God is perfect in every way. So what God states as concluded fact is indeed a concluded fact. See, David wanted to build a house, but God had a perfect plan in mind. David was thinking of a building project but God was thinking of building people. David's heart led to David's actions when David wanted to know what God called him to do. He wanted to know exactly how to follow God, how to live according to his will, how to walk in his ways. And when David did that, you'll have to read the rest of 2 Samuel 7 on your own. Starting in verse 18, it's this, great prayer of thanksgiving that David offers to God. Who am I that you have chosen me? A prayer that we could all say, this is why you are great, Lord. Now, Lord, fulfill the promises that you have made. Honor the covenants. I am your servant. Let's pray. Lord, we indeed are your servants. Lord, we don't want to come to you with our plans Lord, we want to know what your plans are that we might walk in them. Lord, that we might know your will and live in it. Lord, we ask that you would use your word and your spirit to show us what your will is, show us what your word to us means. Lord, help us to grow to be more like Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, and in whose name we pray, amen.